Okay, so I'm gonna start. How are you guys? Are you guys tired? Not yet, cool. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Catherine, and today, before we start, I'd like you to help me take a look at the above advertising images here. And you can tell me what does it say in the image, and what are the messages being communicated in these very simple ads and media. So here goes the first one. So this one reads, another love match trip fact, but Lyso has prevented many such tragedies by happening. How? By effectively addressing females' malodor and hygiene issues. Lyso is a company back in the 1930s. It was once very famous and successful. It sells deodorant and perfume and disinfectants for, for women. Um, and in the 1930s, they produced endless ads showing a man leaving his wife and children alone over the unspeakable feminine hygiene problem. But the business was once very successful. And what about this one? In the 1930s, dancing was also a very important social activity for people to do in their free time. And shampoo companies wanted us to worry about another way we could, we could smell bad. And let's see another, another one. This one really emphasizes the importance of SA, where my stocking appeal with the claim that husbands and my wives will keep their stockings perfect. In the 1930s, companies like Lux, which is brand we're so very familiar with today, capitalized on the insecurities of married women to worry about maintaining their attractiveness after marriage. And there is such a direct correlation, as the ad suggests, between the women's efforts in maintaining their stockings to their husband's satisfaction. And the ad warns, don't let your wrinkles kill SA. So these examples we've so far seen are examples of how brands have historically capitalized on insecurities of a particular gender to sell products. So it's a strategy in marketing that has evolved and fundamentally remains unchanged. In recent days, we often see women trying to fit into the gender ideals and beauty patterns with bad connotations. But have you ever thought about why it's harmful? It seems kind of okay to do that, right? Well, so first think about how the ideal gender or ideal femininity is being promoted and represented in these ads. Today we're seeing so many gender stereotyping ads now on the market with so beautifully photoshopped pictures. But they're so photoshopped that they are creating the unrealistic beauty standards for us. They have powerful effect on how we see ourselves and how we think we should look. 50% of ads found in teen magazine use what's termed sexualized beauty a stereotype used for gender to sell products. Embedding a mindset from a very young age that beauty is, beauty is defined by looking and acting this way. That is, these ads editors love to use Photoshop that made models too thin to be true. For example, in a very famous event, um, in a premium fashion magazine cover, the Ralph Lauren magazine, the, cover, um, the cover's model's head was Photoshopped by the editor to look bigger than her hips which was an anatomical impossibility. However, after the scandal, this model was soon fired by the label because her boss argued that she was too fat after comparing her with the um, ideal body image of the model that's on the cover page, and argued that she was too fat to fit into the clothes. So you can tell that um, this should have been totally unnecessary because in reality, she was totally normal and healthy. But people were putting the simile normal, pervasive, yet utterly un unattainable and artificial and fake standards on women. And that's very brutal and sad. And today, women in ads are more likely to be portrayed or photoshopped as pale, beautiful, thin moms or wives or caring grandmoms or other flawless models. However, according to an eye-opening research that 65% of women don't feel represented in ads. But why? The puzzle, the discrepancy is very perplexing and intriguing. Though we see them most often, the stereotypes constructed in these advertisements aren't real. They aren't representative. They are artificial, and they are overly photoshopped. Therefore, they are very unattainable. They are not the actual normalcy, and it turned out to not match us. Nevertheless, here comes the tricky and sad part. Women in the real world measure ourselves against these impossibly photoshopped and monotonous images every single day. But do you notice that, that they don't actually exist? They are just artificially 
perfectly curated figures. And that's like lying on the um, media public image. So this truly, and indeed hurts women's self-esteem. It wouldn't allow us to appreciate our real beauty once this fake beauty comes into our way. And I'm going to show you other two very interesting images. Um, these are the before and after Photoshop images that are leaked for a famous cosmetic brand and a famous clothing brand. They all reveal a stark contrast between the reality and the enhanced advertisements. So it's crucial to acknowledge that these unrealistic beauty standards and gender norms impact everyone, even regardless of gender. <coughs> and public media since ancient time, like sculptures, to the 20th century's printed advertisements on the streets you might see, and to today's online social platforms, like YouTube or Instagram, are the things we're basically seeing every day. And can you guys um, just take a guess on how many hours on average teenagers spend on their social media daily? Was that seven? seven or yeah, that's correct. Seven or eight for tiny teenagers. So basically, they are the things that we've been incorporating into our life, and they are deciding how we perceive the world, how we set criteria to evaluate ourselves and our peers socially. And it changes our ideals and desires periodically. That's the power of media. It's very powerful. They help construct images. They help set expectations about social categories, gender ideal, and gender normalcy to us. They follow us from the earlier stage in the toy shop and they influence the careers we choose at school. So it's almost like an early conditioning from a very young age. That is what we call as gender normalcy pushed by propaganda and advertisements in recent centuries. And not only the models are the victims of these unrealistic beauty standards and gender norms. Audience, you are, and I am too. Why? Remember, ads sell more than products. They sell ideas subconsciously. They teach us how to behave, how to look to become that decent and normal person in that gender category. So advertisers in history have appealed to and largely contributed to people's insecurities in the hopes of selling them a solution. And in fact, advertisements are so strongly associated with selling securities that when women are shown images of perfect um, products like deodorants or shoes or perfume in a context of fictional ads, that is, overly flawless ads, they're more likely to respond to questions negatively, like how attractive do you find yourself or are you satisfied with your body? Many feel hollow and depressed after comparing themselves to the so-called perfect or normal images depicted by these public media. This discrepancy between what we perceive to be the normalcy in public media and what turns out to be the actual normalcy in real life is very perplexing. Because the term normal usually refers to being typical, being common, being pervasive. So by that logic, we would expect most people to fit into the category, huh? But just like what said, 65% of women don't get represented in these ads. However, the puzzle we're seeing today, the discrepancy we're seeing today, is not unique. It's very pervasive in the past as well. So let's see another example to better understand this perplexity and normalcy problem. So in 1955, the American Museum of Natural History showcased two sculptures meant to represent the average man and average woman. They're named Norma and Norman. And one day, um, they found that these sculptures were based on measurements collected from tens of thousands of men and women. In the same year, a contest was launched to find the living embodiment of Norma, the typical woman. So the newspaper headline will be proclaimed, Are you Norma, the typical woman? Yet not one of the 4,000 women who participated in the contest matched Norma, the supposedly normal woman. So, we can tell that the standardized traits of masculinity and femininity were encapsulated in these art pieces. Now, after this example, you might find the pattern of normalcy. The stereotypes and advertisements for public media, no matter if it's the sculptures in the past or the modern ones like these um, advertisements we're seeing, they aren't real, they aren't representative, they are usually overly retouched and overly photoshopped. So that, in turn, makes it very unattainable and almost impossible to achieve, just like Norma and Norma. Don't get regarded as normal and correct, even in some cases. Nevertheless, what does that have to do with us? 
because media shapes our perception. It determines our real-world behaviors. When we measure ourselves against these impossibly retouched images of normalcy, we might hurt our self-esteem. So this is where stereotypes become problematic. When we apply the standard of normal to all of humanity that is based on the data from a non-representative slice, when these limited or inaccurate definitions of normalcy are being used to make decisions that actually impact people's lives, they can do real harm. We would often discriminate other features that are deemed not normal, but diversity is what really makes it normal. And there's a very famous writer called Simon de Beauvoir. She had a very groundbreaking book that was published in 1949 called The Second Sex. She wrote that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Does the statement sound queer to you? What does it mean we are not born to be that, but we learn to be that? So womanhood is not inherent, but it's actually a product of socialization and learning. So why do we all end up becoming the nominal women? And who is that telling us to become it? So that leads to examining if the nominal woman is suitable for individuals and what it would be like without it. The examples of gender norms we've so far looked at um, come from a variety of domains and brands, including, um, we've talked about cosmetics brands, armpit deodorant, and shampoo, and basically um, fashion magazines. So just to understand the power of seeing something over and over and over again, to the point we simply accept it without any questions. Let's imagine another parallel universe where everything is reversed. Okay, take a look at this. What can you tell? So here, this artist walks gender roles in sex is vintage as to prove how absurd they actually are. Um, this one says, don't cry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. And the previous one says, you mean a woman can open it versus you mean a man can open it? Okay. So sometimes we just feel like these um, gender norms that have been propagated pervasively by these gender, by these sexist ads just doesn't make any sense, right? So women are saying no. Women are rejecting this. They want a more diverse definition of womanhood and beauty. They don't want to be objectified in these ads anymore. They don't want to be overly photoshopped with these unattainable ideals anymore. Because they also want to step into the STEM fields too. They also want to take on roles that were previously deemed unsuitable for them. So, here it comes. Many people are exhausted. Many people don't want to take it anymore. So if you just felt a second uncomfortable about sexism, the second you're irritated by these sexist ads, we can all do something about it. We are all being affected by these sexist images and ads. We all have a profound stake in challenging them. There have already been people who petitioned to Seventeen Magazine to use less Photoshop and worked. And we can also share our stories about our own interpretations of gender online to tell other people, you've got the right to define it yourself. And let's create a climate which is friendly for all human natural attributes and free them from labels. Thank you. The problem with media bias is that it does not end with advertisements. It goes one more way back uh, into the information that we're presented on a daily basis. For example, on the front page of news, so, Alpha is going to introduce to us what news channels doesn't tell you. Let's welcome him.